My name is Adam Cook, I'm VI Consultancy Partner at NHS, the building community. It's a low travel record, but not very good. Um, I've been an analyst in the NHS for 29 years now, and I'm going to talk to you about the Better Health, Better Housing, Better Health project. It's actually I'm in the middle of it at the moment, so we've got no outcome, it's just kind of methodology. So I'm going to be giving them out. So uh, what is better health? Better housing, better health. So the National Energy Foundation, which is a national um organization have set up this service, which kind of old standard service is a telephone advice line. So people can phone up and get some advice on central heating, what insulation, that kind of stuff, to help improve their housing. And there is a BH, BH plus service, which have a home visit element. So when their resident phones up, they say, yeah, we'll send someone around and someone can go around and check all that. They're double blazing, what have you, on there. So that's set up by National Organization for National Energy Foundation in that for sure, as I will be referring to them. And you can see on there a number of councils have bought into that service. Oxfordshire County Council came to us to ask about um, doing an evaluation of that survey. So these are the players who are involved. So there's us at SBW who are kind of doing an evaluation. We're doing the um, quantitative evaluation service. NHS Digital as was um, got involved with um, the IG, the DARS, and we'll come on to that later. National Energy Foundation of Girls, Oxford County Council, and the University of Salford at Manchester are now recently come on board to do a qualitative evaluation service. Um, I won't mention them much because they've only just started not doing a huge deal. So, what's our challenge? What did Oxfordshire want us to do? Basically, they want to see if it's worth is it worth public funds going into this service to um so they can carry it on. And uh, make sure it's actually the name does what it says. It's going to improve housing. Is it improving people's health across the community? And they, it's not just that, that's obviously the main thing, but they want to see, you know, benefits and costs for themselves of the council and their partner agencies. So we've got a number of milestones to go through for that. Um, evaluation plan, which was done at the beginning. Where we sorted out what we were going to be doing with them, all nice and done. The interim report, which was done in January, and not as good as we thought it was going to be because of issues, I will be talking to you about later. And the final evaluation report, which is due in October this year. So I'll come back to this later, but this is the data flow. It's not complicated, it's a fairly simple data flow coming from their things, what should share flow and into us. A link to a number of services in Oxfordshire. It should be nice and easy to get that. It has been. So I'll come back to that later. What was our solution to their problem? Um, kind of four track thing a demographic evaluation. So the data that NEF has contains obviously the demographic data of the people being seen. So usual start, age, sex, ethnicity, we've got their postcode so we can work out you know, deprivation, things like that. But also, there's information around their housing as well for their long installation, their double blending, and central heating. All that kind of stuff is there and available on that. So we can do a demographic evaluation analysis of what's going on, who those people are. Then we've got some qualitative data outcomes. So every time a resident calls up to get either some phone help or a visit help, they're given a questionnaire around their help based on the SF. 36, loosely based on it, not exactly that, but it's based on it. Um, so we get that when they're given the visit or phone call, they also do one. Currently, it was originally three months later, they've now shortened it to one month later. I'm not sure if that's a good length of time to get any useful information from, but that's what we've decided to do. Our main bit of analysis is the retrospective match cohort analysis, which I will be talking about on the next slide. And a bit of longitudinal right hand tracking. So we're looking at the data that we've got over time, just at kind of individual person level. So our big analysis 
And I haven't started doing this yet. I've been looking at it and working on it. It's the next two weeks I'm going to start actually getting into the meat of this. Is a retrospective match cohort methodology. So we've got three cohorts. Those who have a telephone consultation, those who have a home visit, and we're building a control population based on the demographics of those um, two groups. We're going to create a population who have neither, um, which we'll be taking from for each well match it to, so we'll match it to such data. So we'll be building some sub data and match third match control code. Um, and we'll be looking at their health, instead of sub data. So in patients, like patients A and E, I'm trying to get hold of the community so the data set and the NHMDS as well linked to that. There's also some social care data from the council that's going in there. And we are getting some primary care data as well. We've got Oxfordshire have a platform called Health and Intent, which is a very care based one, so we need to into that. Um, and so we're doing difference in difference analysis. So there's a difference between those three cohorts, which we'll be looking at, but also there's an intervention point for each cohorts. There's a before and after. So that's kind of difference in difference that we're looking for. The advantages of doing this is. Largely around scale. It's quick, it's easy, we can do it with a smaller population. And so that's where we're going for that. There are some disadvantages, largely down to bias and outcome and making assumptions around such small populations. So we just have to be aware of that as that analysis happens. Now we've had a number of challenges in this whole project which meant it's taken a lot longer than it should have done. The first issue that we had was largely down to us being in the NHS. We thought, yeah, we can easily link this data because we can get it from them and it'll have the NHS number on. Of course it doesn't have the NHS number on. Why would we think that? Because it's come from a private sector organization. It doesn't. We've got names and addresses and all that stuff no NHS number. So our next, so we then followed through to other false assumptions. One, the Oxford Council could stick the um, NHS number on it for us, which they could for a small cohort of people, maybe about six of them, a very small <laughs> cohort of people, um, because if those people are in contact with adult social care services, they won't have that NHS number. So it's not that. And also, there are children who are looking at households, there are children involved in the cohorts, they wouldn't give us any kind of child nature in this either. So we were stuck there. Then we thought, that's fine, we can trace at SCW, we can use PES tracing service and do a um, tracing of those numbers. And our, G, our, our G team then told us, no, we're not allowed to do that, we can do that. So we kind of scratched our heads for a bit and um, came up with a number of potential solutions. First of all, Oxford County Council were already batch tracing some records through the PBS. They were sending off records to be traced and getting them back. But well, we can add some data for that. Brilliant idea, but they were doing it not regularly enough. It had an additional cost. So maybe. Forget that. Let's just send the data we want by us, which is the PDF tracing service, and they can do it as well. Again, that cost got prohibited. You couldn't do that. Um, so we then said, all right, if we don't have permission from the PDF trace this, maybe we'll go get that. So we contacted the PDF tracing service and they said, your IT team is completely wrong. Of course, you've got permission to do this tracing, you should have been able to do it already. You just don't have the software. So, after a bit of two and we've got the software, we have a DMA team, which is a kind of outpost of NHS Digital within um, our organization. So, we can land the data in there. They've got the software, they can do it. And we are currently tracing around 50% of. The records that are coming through. This is what we're getting through. This is the latest cohort. So, since we originally started collecting data, 
around I'm trying to remember it was late 2021. This is what we've got so far. It's about 700, 800 records in total. We're facing around 50% as well. The cost of living crisis has been really helpful here because more and more people are using the service than before. We were expecting only to have a cohort of about 250 people. Now we've got nearly 800, only tracing 50%. We've still got a nice chunky number to analyze. Otherwise, we could be looking at a hundred less than a hundred records. But we don't want to leave it at that. We'd like to bump it up a bit more. So those records that have got no match or insufficient data, currently sending them back to Oxfordshire saying, okay, have a look at these. Is if they're spelling mistake in a surname, it's throwing it away or you know, an extra space in the postcode because those little things throw out the tracing software to get their next done back. So we're sending it back to that, and they're investigating it. And there is a time and resources issue here. If they do have the time and resources to go and look them up and check that, they will do it and get the um, data back to us, and we can then use that. NHS number tracing was one problem. Data linkage was another major problem. As you can see, our project started in September. 2021. Our balance wasn't signed off till December. Do that's nearly 18 months. Us pursuing um, NHS Digital and a dance application to allow us to link to a non-health or care data set. Um, this has been our biggest problem, as you can probably held that gap. Our first challenge was a non-NHS or non-social care data set. We were told by NHS Digital that this was unprecedented. I don't know if it is or not, but they told us it was unprecedented and that it couldn't be done. It needs a lot of thought to it. Obviously, they've had 18 months of thought and decided that it was okay to do it. And there's now a precedent should anybody wish to um, follow it through. Um, there was also a problem with our consent statement. So I guard up at NHS Digital, who are the ultimate signers off, said, Mm, we don't like your consent statement. Obviously, we were asking the residents to give their consent to have their data be used in this kind of analysis. Um, and then there were the minor media problems and moving CCG to ICD, which meant that some of the DARS applications that were in process had to be changed from CCG to ICD to push it back. Um, number of potential solutions. Data flow from NAP to Oxford, to, but instead of it coming straight to SW, flow it to Oxford Chat, and then we can piggyback on the new system to actually guard that quest. Use that, which is the solution we did eventually go for. We did think about using the Digital Economy Act. There's a line in there about using data for research and it not having to go through this kind of process to link it up. We set our IG team off to look, look at that. And after a while, the months, they came back and said, no, you can't, because it doesn't seem to include NHS data within the act, so you can't use it. And we also had a new consent statement from recommended by IGAR that we had to implement. The new consent statement, um, kind of this, um, but I'm not going to read it all out anyway. The old consent, consent statement was that the client understood what was going on. The new one, explicitly, they give their consent their data to be used, and they can have that um, consent, they can withdraw that consent at any point in the year when we need the new analysis. That's fine, except, as I said, we already started collecting data from September 2021 which meant that a whole cohort of people had already consented to the original consent statement. So we had to talk to IGARD about that, and they said, you need to go back to um, get a 70% sample of those we've already consented, and um, if you can get um, that 70% all to say, yeah, that's fine, we agree to the new consent statement, we'll assume that everybody does. So we did go back. And we got 91% of people who had a home visit agreed to the new consent statement. 
78 percent of the people who telephoned in Z agree, or about 70 percent of what we looked at. So we said, fine, we're going to assume everyone agrees to the new consent statement, apart from three people who didn't <coughs> agree at all to the new one, and we had to take them out of the analysis. So now we've got that data flow. So it flows from there to Oxford County Council, where it goes into SCW to trace. Inside SCW, it's trade and then pseudonymized. So I can then link it to the SUS data set using the same pseudonymization key because one of our concepts at SCW is to hold the SUS data for Oxford Chair. So we can link it through using the same pseudonymization key. And I've got those data sets. The trace data goes back to Oxford County Council, Council, where we can link to the primary care data on their health intent platform. They also got the social care data, and they can link to that as well. Within that, all comes back to me in that bottom bubble there, and I'm doing some of our analytics on it to get a final report. Our current position we've had some successes. Apart from getting all the dollar dust and um, data leakage and permission stuff sorted, our evaluation plan was agreed. 300 visits made, so that 300 visits where many more phone calls happened, which has got plenty of information in case studies. First iteration of the report was done in January. That was only just after we got the guard permission. So we had no data in case of that. That initial report was based on the um, resident survey data. So their survey at time of phone call and their survey after phone call. Our initial results from that were actually quite promising. There were small improvements in health. And my general feeling is we're going to see small improvements and we're not going to see anything big over time. Um, and I have successfully now, within the last few weeks, linked to the inpatient outpatient they, um, emergency care data sets. So I've got some data from there. We can start looking through that, build up on that catalogs. Well, links to community and mental health data sets. That's just an internal issue in SCW finding the work and that's the condition. Um, as I said, the NHS numbers, 50%, mm, it's not great, but it's doable at the moment with the numbers we've got, we'd like to get it up. Um, then we decided, this is retrospect. Oxford County Council said, oh, it'd be good to get this published. Now, if we're going to get this published and do that, we should have got ethics improvement to start with. We didn't, so we're trying to go through. We're working through an ethics approval process to see if we can get representative ethics approval to publish. Um, I think that's hitting a bit of a roadblock at the moment, but in the long run, it depends what journal we go forward and might if we should decide to write it up at some point. So, the summary we wrap up. We sorted out the data flows, we sorted out our IT issues. We've derived an NHS number, we've done a report, we've got some data linkage, and I've done some QA and that with data. Good, brilliant, we've done. Got some number of things to do. Some more data linkage, cohort, match cohort analysis, a bit of longitudinal analysis, interpretation of that analysis, and report writing. Could be done by October. So yeah, not much long to do, not much time to do it in. Obviously, if we haven't had the issues around the DARS and the data linkage issues, we'd do, I'd be halfway through writing that by now. Nearly finished. Um, so yeah, it's a bit of a push towards the end, but that's where we are. So I've probably gone through that faster than I expected to. So anybody got any questions? Yes. Our initial evaluation plans had a, I wouldn't say it was a thorough logic model, but it had a small logic model based around the expectations of what um, Oxfordshire County Council were hoping to see. 
So they said, you know, we would be expecting to see this kind of improvement of health. And so we went to them and said, well, if you're doing that, we need to look at this, this, and this. So there was a, a basic, but not thorough, as you might want to say. Yeah. I just asked around the data we were learning. Would it help if you could imagine a cohort selection, for example, with anything digital data or synthetic data tests on the board? For my way of thinking, yeah. I think if we could have worked through some of that to start with, um, that kind of thing would be really useful. I think our problem was we couldn't see the woods and the trees because we got mired down in this data linkage DARS application and um, NHS number tracing. That kind of threw us all out of everything. If I think if we went back to the start, we'd have sorted that out much sooner because I think a number of false assumptions were made and then maybe we would have tried some kind of synthetic modeling first. Yeah. In what 50% matching would you yeah. have that data systematically different between the two groups because those that don't match. Is it a different population from those where you have a match and you're going to have a The overall population is actually quite similar. It's um it's what you would expect. It's a lot of um, older single resident households. Um, there are some younger family groups in that, but the majority of the matched and the unmatched fall about the same kind of criteria. So I'm not, that's another reason why I'm not overly worried that we're only getting 50% match rate. That matched and unmatched are fairly similar. I wouldn't say they're completely homogenous, but they are fairly similar group ones. You talk more about the average cohort ratio. I guess it's very many different group people, but it yeah. looks like they're all about the same. Yes. And how are we choosing that kind of thing? I'm working through that at the moment, so I'm doing that exactly. I'm doing that. We've got a couple of data scientists on our SPW who I'm talking with about doing that. Initially, I'm looking at the two cohorts we've got, the telephone group and the home visit group, we're looking at their demographic data. I'm going to look at those people we've got in SUS who currently aren't in either of those groups and then try and build up to a population that is similar kind of percentages of those demographic issues within that population. But it's going to take a bit of time with effort. So, what the hell would they decide? It's not actually that. I'm curious if there's 50% fairly matched. We, we are looking into that. We, I'm suspecting that when Oxford had gone through it, it's going to be spelled in states, um, in names. There'll be people who've got Nizzy Smith instead of Ethel Smith missing out, where the postcode has got. Two spaces in the middle instead of one. Little things like that. I think little errors like that to throw in the data source um, actually builds up to quite a Just because I'm not trying to do PDS, but it seems like PDS I know. I'm, I tend to go back to the trace to and say, is that kind of what you would expect? Um, so, yeah, I think partly the data raw for net is. Not clean, they haven't been clean. They're just thinking these things. Obviously, one of the key learnings is actually the rest of working with partners across the yeah. spectrum. Context of the study is a very expensive product to match because of that photograph. Yeah, so you could probably do that. But it's more a case of actually, therefore, how good does the data set have to be for the tracing service to work? Yeah, because the things you describe should be. I, I was hoping for up to 75%, and that's the 75 to 80% of my goal. I can't explain why it's not like that in moment to investigate. I've got an ask it to the source of post case for you. Yeah, it might be post case, it might be spelling it. Um, it needs the data for surname, at least the first initial or the first few letters, first name, um, IP, the registered GP, and a couple of other fields that need to be there. If anyone goes, has got something slightly wrong, a transfer of date. Um, missing out there in the spelling state, it chucks it out. It does not do fuzzy matching or 
close match in. It's an exact match or nothing. So we expect parents, like I said, I would like to say, you might like make 50%, 50%. Fortunately, what's the living class? Those sorts of aim, yeah, because we've got a bigger staff than we would expect we've got to start with that project. Yes. Um, when you're looking at NSF systems, are you looking at specific health conditions or are you looking at the overall? Um, I was going to start out looking at specific health conditions, seeing at least what they're coming in for by you know diagnosis code kind of to start with, at least. Especially maybe but initial diagnosis code and um, look at how many are within the variant diagnoses. Um, that breaks it down to, you saw, you know, 300 odd match, that breaks it down to about 200 categories. So it is a bit much. So I will be looking at individual conditions and treatments, but aggregating them up as much as possible. So it might be the heart condition, things like that, rather than specific individual diagnosis. Yeah. Uh, oops, yes. If you had a magic wand, what would you change <laughs> about the non outpatient versus a pound and feel? Um, yeah, I would change everything that we did, <laughs> which is an easy thing to say. Um, I would go back to basics. I think we will be led slightly by our own duty, so it would be easy. So I would, um, Started with a brand new DARS application instead of spending time trying to find an open one partway through the piggyback on scrap all that to start cleaning with a brand new DARS application specific to this project that we could use. That would be the first step. And I think, again, because we were linking non health and care data, I think we should have gone to iGuard for advice before we started. Rather than go through the DARS process and then be rejected by the high guard at the end, we should have gone to that and say, okay, we're planning to do this. What would you recommend we do it in DARS? And would you sort of make a consent statement to have them have it already done? We can go at the end, don't do it like that. Anything else? No? Well, thank you for listening, everybody.